It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your city of ideas. Uh, what a place it's been. So I suppose my idea was the World Wide Web. I invented the World Wide Web 20 years ago. But I'm not going to... Uh, but I'm not going to talk about it as an idea. Uh, it was quite a good one, you know, but uh, some work, some don't. But I'm mainly going to talk about it as being a platform for new ideas. And that's what is most important. That's his main role, and that's what we need to, 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 to preserve it as. So I'm going to talk a bit about exciting things happening on new websites, uh, if you're designing websites. I'm going to talk a bit about putting data on the web. I'm going to talk a bit about us protecting the web and the internet from the worries that a lot of people have about it. So in those things I'm going to do, picked out from a million things, I could have talked, because so much is happening on the web, and I've got 19.08 minutes left. So, to start with, the exciting things which are happening at the moment on the, on the web. If you are making websites, you will use languages like HTML. Now, I wrote the original HTML language. I didn't even give it a number. I didn't call it HTML0 or 1 uh, back 20 years ago. I should explain that the Internet was invented 40 years ago. So 40 years ago, Vint Cerf and his colleagues figured out that it, if all these computers which had networks were connected so that each connect com computer could talk to another computer which could indirectly talk to another computer which could talk to another computer that they could send little messages through across these networks in a way that would connect all these networks into one big internet so they, call it, they called it the internet and people used this system for many things they used it for email they, you could log on to another computer. You could, in a way, get information back. But there was no information space. There was no click. There was no HTML. There was no HTTP. There was no URL. So when I came along, I was just frustrated. <laughs> I needed to be able to connect this information together. A lot of the information was on, already on the web. And so, sorry, it was already on computers, which were connected to the network. So I just invented the HTTP protocol and this HTML language, and then made the first web server, which is now 20 years ago. And it's been an incredible 20 years. About three or four years after that, uh, I had been trying to persuade people to use the web, trying to persuade them it would not be too complicated, trying to persuade them that uh, it would be worth putting their information out on the web. Uh, but, and, and it was like pushing a bobsled. I haven't done it, but I imagine it's... You have to... Uh, first, you have to push really hard, and then it starts to go faster, and then it goes downhill, and you really have to jump in, and then it goes down the hill. And at that point, I had to make the World Wide Web Consortium. I came to America, because that's where the center of gravity of the Internet was, just from the computers which were on the Internet. We started the World Wide Web Consortium. We've been developing the standards. And if you go to w3.org, you'll find out now about HTML5, all the really exciting things you can do with it. So that's one of the latest things when it comes to web pages. There are lots of other th interesting, exciting things happening. Of course, the web is going from the screens that everybody used, which were all the same size when we started the web. Now the screens are getting bigger, like this. And they are getting smaller onto the watch size. Everybody has portable devices. So there's this incredible move onto different sorts of devices, which is really exciting. Not only exciting for early adopters, it's really exciting for people, as we just heard, with mobile for development. The World Consortium had a big push for the mobile web for development because in a lot of countries, the only place, the only place you're going to see the web is on the phone. So we really had to make it so that it the web works not only for the very fancy devices, we have to make it so that it works for the simplest devices that we've got. So one of the really exciting things that's happening then on the web is that the web pages are getting more exciting and more interactive. HTML5 
is, in fact, more than just a web page language. In a way, when you create a web page nowadays, you create a program, you have a programming environment just like, you can make programs just like the programs that run on a computer or run on a phone. So when you make a web app, it can do more and more things. It's a very powerful computing environment, and the web app computing environment is a better one to use than just writing a phone app or a computer app. If you write a phone app, it will work on one phone. It'll be difficult to move it to a different phone. And who knows what it will do with future phones. The web apps will work on a phone. They'll work on, if you, write, if you do them well, they will work on all kinds of other devices, past but also, really importantly, future. Because the path of HTML has always been to be as compatible as possible. So the new browsers will be able to read your, new, your old HTML5 page in another 20 years' time. So HTML5 is, uh, uh, is a web app pro pro uh, platform. And recently, somebody, uh, there have been a few articles pointing out that there's a danger to the web from phone apps. Because if you put your information into a phone app, if and I'm reading it, and I find something really exciting, uh, something about the soccer, something about uh, the, tr the plane we really have to get. I can't bookmark it because it's not on the web. On the web, everything has a URL. So I can make a pointer to it. I can email you a pointer, and you can look it up. That's how the web works. If I find it on the web, I can make pointers if it's really exciting, everybody will tweet about it, everybody will put pointers to it, and it, will be, and it will be on the web. And so it will be found by search engines. It will be part of this huge, massive, humanity-connected talking about things. If it's on a phone app, it's on a phone app. And there are people who are worried that, in fact, the rise of phone apps is going to actually decrease the value of the web. I think, in fact, Always the outside connected uh, world always wins. It did early on. Do you remember AOL before the web, Prodigy, these dial-up systems? There were, the question was, which dial-up system was going to be the winner? And then the web came along. And the web, in fact, was much more exciting than any of them. The walled garden is very tempting for uh, a big company to make, if it can make it sufficiently enticing, if it can make inside the wall garden to offer you flowers, and so that it will get complete control of you. And there are lots of walled gardens. I don't have to mention the names of specific social networking sites for you, not to, uh, for you to think of one or two walled gardens out there. But the, with the web, it always the outside, because it was an area of open innovation, but always in the end, one beat. It was always one. It was always more exciting because more innovation happened outside the walled garden. So that's one of the things that's uh, happening on the web. There are lots of other things happening on the web. There's one which I want to happening on, happen on the web, and I'm going to use this opportunity to mention it because I spent the last year or two specifically trying asking people. Now, I know that you've got your documents on the web. Now I want you to put your data on the web. What do you mean by data on the web? Well, I've been pushing governments, for example, to put data on the web. It's important for uh, the transparency of the government, but also it's important just for the utility, the economic utility to the country. If you go to the, uh, the Mexican, there's a Mexican government site, uh, there's a portal, a transparency portal, and, you, and I found there some documents about, for example, the amount of the traffic of people going, crossing the border from Mexico to and from the United States of America at different towns over time. It's just the sort of thing which Hans Rosling would, make a great, would be, uh, be able to make a great uh, show out of. But it was a PDF file. It was just a document. There was no, I couldn't get the data. I couldn't put the data into my spreadsheet. I couldn't get it and put it into Hans Rosling's software. To do that, I, had to read it. I would have to retype it all, or I'd have to call them. Okay, so the message is, you need to put data on the web. You need to put data on the web. 
because it's more valuable to your customers, it's more valuable to your supply chain, you need to put data on the web because the country benefits, you need to put data on the web because the world benefits. If you put Mexico data on the web, then people can connect it to other data from other, pe uh, other countries, and bit by bit we will end up with a data snapshot of the world. And now we have a, a climate change crisis, there is no time that it has been more important to have that data snapshot of the world. So, putting data on the web is something I've asked everybody to do. One of the interesting things as well is that this, when you put the data on the web, one of the ways it gets used is by people building web apps. So we have this two levels, of the two markets of information, if you like. The first is the data. People put data on the web. Not exciting to a lot of people in the street. But that, that data is taken and it's used to make web apps on little devices, on big devices, which then produce a much better experience for the users because they've got access to all that data. Okay, so we've got, with HTML5, the web app platform, more exciting things. We've got uh, you all going away and immediately putting data on the web. And so those are just two areas in which the web is becoming uh, more and more powerful. But already, as people have mentioned before, it's in our lives in many ways. That when, you, when you get up in the morning and you look up, uh, you, you find that your child is ill, you go to the web, you look up, to, uh, to find out just what they might have. When you're worrying, you're a teenager, uh, you're worrying, you want to learn about condoms and STDs and AIDS. You use the web in a very intimate way. You use the web in a way that you really don't want somebody looking over your shoulder. There's an assumption we make about the web, how the web works. There's an assumption we make about the internet that when I connect to you, if, you're a long, if I love you very much and you're a long way away and I connect to you, then we like to assume that nobody else is listening. And I like to assume also that if you go out and make an independent film and you put it on your website, but when you put that independent film on your website, I can go and fit, fetch it and I can read it wherever I am. Even if my internet service provider would like to sell me this week's movies from Hollywood, I need the right to be able to go out and connect without discrimination. So, it turns out there are some things about the web which we really need to treasure. Well, there are some things which we need to preserve because we tend to assume that they're fine, but in fact, if you think about a world where when you go there to, to connect to some other part of the, uh, of the world, some, some other person, some idea, some other new idea, there's in fact a little blockage, then there's a problem. If you don't, you must have non-discriminatory ac access. We call it net neutrality. And it's a really important fight that everybody, a few people are pushing really hard. We're all hoping that it will be very smooth and that everybody, and we see a lot of signs as well that a lot of internet service providers realize how important it is and they take it as their ethos that they will allow you to connect to other people without discrimination. Spying is another thing. Governments really need to sometimes to be able to spy on the internet to find serious criminals. There's some serious criminals that, that use the internet in powerful ways and you need a lot of power, you need a lot of technological strength as a government to go and find those criminals, find those terrorists. So that's a power perhaps you feel you need to give your government, but if you give the government that power, then if there are machines which are collecting really detailed information about people's lives, then you've opened up a huge risk. You, if you're collecting data about internet users, then somebody, for every politician, there is a file somewhere which has got details of everything they've done or their house has done on the internet. Is that safe? If somebody could buy that? If somebody could steal it? It's, what happens about, you know, doesn't it open out this possibility of blackmail? Doesn't it open 
even if you feel that the current government that you support, or that you're part of, should have these powers, what happens if in the next round you're not the government and those other people are the government? Would you want those people to have that power? So we have to be very careful about the power which we give governments and we're also about the power which we give large corporations. We have to make sure that people aren't spied on and as there are very strict controls, we have to make sure that people aren't blocked from different sites. Also, we have to make sure that people aren't disconnected. There are a number of laws in various countries. A recent one in France uh, is that if a record company from the USA comes to a French uh, internet service provider, they can say, you know, we think that somebody in this house has stolen this rock music they have downloaded it illegally, then they have the right to send two warnings and then to insist that the house is disconnected, that the house is disconnected from the internet. Just think about the way your house, members of your family use the house, maybe, maybe use the internet, maybe you're a single parent and you look after your kids and meanwhile you work because you have the internet at home. How do you use the internet? Maybe you're old and you use the internet as an emergency lifeline so that if something happens, you can contact people that you care about, contact the ambulance, or just look things up on a medical website. So we use things, the internet in so many ways, it's a very strange form of punishment to disconnect a house and then to make it a very serious crime for anybody to connect that family again. So using internet connection, disconnection as a form of punishment, I think, is a seriously bad idea. Unless you go through the same sort of process with a judge and a jury and a trial that you can get if you're going to imprison somebody physically. If you're going to imprison them virtually, well, you can ask a teenager which they'd find more frightening, which one would be more of a deterrent or, and... Uh, which one they think is a more reasonable form of punishment. So, some people, the, the Finns, for example, in Finland, are, they are starting, they are talking now about access to the net, access to other people across the net as a human right. Now, yes, <laughs> it is true. We should, what about, how, how dare we bring in more human rights without some human responsibilities? Well, so I've told you a lot about human responsibilities. Your human responsibilities are to make sure that this platform that you use, this platform of the web, which is built on top of the platform of the internet, this thing, which is this platform, which allows so many creative things to happen every day. So many new exciting websites, so many new ex exciting genres of literature come, to come out, so many new ideas to flourish. So it is your obligation as one of the users to make sure you look after the web, make sure you look after its net neutrality, make sure you look out, look out that people's use of the web is not disrespected either by large companies or by large governments. And depending on where you are in the world, the threats are different. You can probably think of some countries that um, we've had some lists of, uh, of countries where Facebook is, is not allowed. Clearly, many countries do tend to block internet sites, but would you have thought of the United States of America as being a country where there is a blacklist of sites which are not allowed to be given access? There's a law which people are trying to put through the U.S. system now to make that possible for U.S. government just to issue a blacklist and for all internet service providers in America to have to block that off. So, as it becomes the right, as we look around and we realize that so many people are using it, we realize that we have an obligation to make sure that we are not uh, alone, we the early adopters, only 20% of people on the planet currently use the World Wide Web. What about the others? We've started the World Wide Web Foundation to look after the other 
how can we make sure that the economic development which is happening in developing countries, in poor areas of developed countries, how can we make sure that that economic development, the provision of water, the provision of health care, and the provision of internet access, and provision of a life on, as members of the information society, how can we make sure they all connect together and they all work to reinforce each other to the, most, the greatest possible extent? That is what the Web Foundation is about. Thank you.